it wasn't a pretty picture. And I know you have a lot more data on that. You talk very eloquently on that. But this anomaly we're having right now is very, very strong El Nino. But, you know, we actually went negative on the composite that I follow. You know, I follow a lot of the climatologists out there. Some are pro-warming, some are pro-cooling, and some are just data-driven. And for the longest time, they, they basically said, first of all, they said it's going to be the worst La Nina ever. And then they said, well, we're not going to get any La Nina. And then in just in the last couple of weeks, they're like, whoa, you know, La Nina's back. Sure, Bob, it is. It's been delayed a little bit. And also, if you haven't taken a look, the stratospheric zonal winds, it's on a two-year pattern. And they've been measuring this with weather balloons since the 1950s. And on a regularity, about every two years, like clockwork, it flips from east to west, east to west, east to west. Well, this year it didn't flip. It was six months late in the turnover. And they've just discovered also within the past week and a half that the Pacific water temperatures, specifically the areas that you're talking about in the Enso region, actually drive the tropospheric temperatures in the lower belt. So they've pushed back their forecast for La Nina intensification by about two and a half to three months. The original forecast that came out six months ago, five months ago, had La Nina peaking somewhere in March and April of 2017, going down to about 2.5. It's going to be extended about another three months, so that La Nina should really start to be kicking in at the coolest part, not in April, but somewhere around June, late June, early July should be at the coolest, and it's probably going to peak between, like I said, negative 2.5, uh, some people as high as 2.7, some as low as 2.3. But we just came off of the largest El Nino that we have had in recorded history. And when you do look at those long-term data charts going back into the 1800s, you'll see when there's a significant spike, there's always a significant drop. So yeah, we're and, you know, that. And, and then the 60-year cycle, the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, that's cooling as well. So there's a lot of cooling trends going on and the sunspots decreasing. So we have, you know, three negative cold indicators overlapping on top of each other. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, I was noting it, but at the same time, the, the weather in Australia and in South America Australia. and New Zealand, we're ignoring the it's not going to happen, you know, narrative. And I just said, you know what, there, there's something bigger in play here. And most people haven't seen a solar minimum before. So they don't know the correlations, you know, with a, with a grand solar minimum coming, you know, and so and all and I might just be a the tail wagging the dog versus the driver of the weather. So it's going to be really fascinating to see because one thing that I've noticed is to get an edge in trading is that you need to know what are the precursors. And so what really caught my attention is when sugar and OJ uh, and coffee started to move even though we are still in a, a strong El Nino environment. Now, coffee gets affected because Brazil kind of gets messed up in the El Nino environment. It stayed elevated, and, and sugar and OJ have already doubled. And that's what happened during the last La Nina. So if these prices have already doubled for these crops, and now what's going to help me and help you know my subscribers and your viewers is that we'll see when Australia and when South Africa and when South America really get their grains in the ground and take a hold. Because if they're delayed at all, I mean, it's still snowing and it's your April down in the south. You know, if it's still snowing and they can't get these crops in the ground and it's wet, that's one thing people don't realize. They think global cooling is just cold. And if it was just that, you can deal with it, but you can't deal with cold and wet. And that's what's gonna happen to these fields. I mean, you look now, this is four years now in Northwestern Europe where these fields just get incredibly soggy. Well, what happens is they can't get the farm equipment into the ground. The, the water holds four times the energy as air, so the crops don't come out of the ground as fast. And then the mold and the rust don't dissipate. And so you, you get these crop losses. And that's what's happening in Brazil. You know, it's not just simply the weather that's causing devastation, although the frost was very harmful to their crops going forward into the out years, I'm talking next year and the year after, is that now they're being affected by, there's a rust forming everywhere. And so that's going to harm the crop. And then also there's a, a beetle that's reducing the crop prices. So 
there's a lot of things that happen when this weather starts to turn cold. And, you know, as an aside, it's just so ironic to me. The people that are global warming fearful crowd is that they should pray for global warming. Because if you notice, when we're warm, we produce a lot of food and the economy is great and the civilizations are calm. But when things get cold, I mean, be careful what you wish for is because when things get cold is when things get treacherous. You don't have food shortages when you have an El Nino. You have food shortages when you have a La Nina and you're going to have double food shortages when the La Nina and the AMO and the, and the PDO are all cold, and then you have a cold sun. So as these three cycles, you know, manifest itself, one of the things that, you know, you talk about, and I'll let you jump in here too, is that the latitude bands of growing shrink. It's not just the grain belt, but the tropic belt shrink too. All the growing regions, people can't move their crops fast enough for how fast this manifestation is going to happen, and that's what's going to cause a lot of the issues. The two points is, if we go back in history, every single time one of these grand solar minimums comes, yes, there are years that are incredibly cold, but there's also some stable years in there. But the problem is the mold and the blight and the rust, they lost so many crops that that's where a lot of their failures came from, not from the actual not being able to grow it due to cold, but the planting season was late, the moist ground conditions, and then when they harvested, Everything was moldy on the heads and they couldn't actually eat what they produced. And then we look at this year from France and Russia, the protein content was so low. And again, the same thing, the mold and the blight on there, Egypt refused the bids from France and Russia for the wheat supply this year going into Egypt. And then if we look at 45 degrees north, that's typically where the edge of the grow belt stops during the grand solar minimum. If we look at a global wheat crop map everywhere 45 north and above 50 north 55 north it's all going to go offline so how many yeah, so metric tons is that that's going to be lost and how you know how many exponential food rises is that going to be if we lose 200 million tons of wheat out of 700 million tons or 750 million tons oh i i think the price increase is going to be incalculable you know, but here's a really weird thing. It's not even just be that. It's that every country, you know, right now we export grain. Well, you know, in America, it could be the point where we just grow enough. And that means some countries may not get anything. And with a population that's already rejecting international trade, I, I think it's just going to be absolutely ugly. And, you know, so you took the words out of my mouth. I think what happened here is when you saw this incredible wheat production, so that drove the price of wheat to the floor. And, and as you note, though, the quality of the wheat, it's not fit for human consumption. If people look at, go to the grocery store, is that you notice pasta prices haven't come down. They're up. Okay, the price of wheat in the last two years, exactly, the price of wheat has fallen in half in one year or two years. And so I go and look at the pasta prices, and pasta prices have doubled since 2011. Anymore, people are, if they can't get the news out of a hashtag, that they're not interested. You know, but when you dig an inch deeper, you start seeing some of these things which are actually incredible. So the wheat is not fit for human consumption. It's only fit for animal feed. There's always good news, bad news is, you know, the price of eggs have fell through the floor because they're just feeding all this stuff to the chickens. Price of cheap, beef has fell through the floor because it's super cheap. But what's going to happen is next year, when all these mills start buying again, is that this quote-unquote surplus that's out there is not going to be there. And people are going to be absolutely dumbstruck. Why is wheat flying? You know, production is not going to be off that much. It's because there's no surplus. And then, you know, you have the opacity of China, which is ironic. You know, it, it's amazing to me. You know, our news media just does not report news. I don't really even know what their function is anymore. They don't challenge anything that's said. So China is telling people they're exporting corn now. You know, well, one thing, you have to ask them why. Why don't their people want that corn? It's probably garbage. It's been in bins for two years. It's probably moldy. But it was just a sound bite to throw the algorithms off to try to drive corn prices down. What was really interesting, though, this time, Dave, is that they put that news out 
the price of corn dropped for an hour and then went through the roof. 